Welcome everyone to this week's webinar. We've got a special guest with us today, Ian Hudson, also known as Morpheus. Welcome, Ian, and thank you for joining us this week. Thank you very much, Philippe. <laughs> so, Ian, I'm going to give it over to you. Ian's going to surprise us with uh, a Chris, great thank you very much. video. Thank you, Chris. I'm ready to go. Thank you. Have a, uh, I'm really looking forward to this. It's going to be a lot of fun. Turn your volume up. Floor is yours. Distinguished guests, please welcome international keynote speaker, conscious leadership expert, Ian Hatton, also known as Morphe. This is life-changing influence, and that's what this is all about. Imagine if you had the freedom to lead from who you truly are. Well, maybe you do. Maybe all you need to do is simply embrace your unique essence. As a conscious leader, this is a game changer. This is how you impact your world. You're a leader. Every one of you is a leader. Every one of you. Because your life is going to be about influence. And as you influence, you are leading. So let's throw away the idea that leadership is just a position. It's not. Leadership is a skill. Leadership is bringing a change to the world, and I believe we all have that capability. Your journey of becoming a conscious leader starts with you connecting with yourself. Are you courageous enough to see how deep that rabbit hole goes. All right, uh, welcome everybody. I'm going to be talking trust this morning and uh, really exciting to, excited to be with you for this now. I'm going to start, actually, let me just go one more slide first. I'm going to start with a, a little bit of a question for you. And that question is, what is trust? What is trust? So just pop into the chat. What is trust to you? Uh, I have a chat window up here ready. What does trust mean to you? Oh, nice one, Dave. Knowing someone's got your back. I like it. Knowing I'm safe. Yes. Accurately judge others' intentions, actions, and honesty. Very good. Respect and safety. Very good. Communicating freely, knowing that there is safety. Believing and knowing I will be safe. There is so, so much safe coming up. What else? What else is trust to you? If you think of trust with your team or trust with your clients, what does that mean? And by the way, you can answer more than once. Knowing I can let go, there's a good one. Very good, I like that. Somebody said to me, it's knowing I can be imperfect. Hmm. I thought that was quite good. Oh, nice one, Dave. Success, adm admitting success and failure. And I like the way that it's both, that we can be honest about our successes and we can be honest about our failures. I love that. Brilliant. By the way, feel free to use the emojis by, um, you know, loving or liking people's comments. Uh, faith in my leadership. Absolutely. Thank you, three, uh, for that. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. Okay, so I'm going to tell a little story about trust. 
And the story is, uh, we've done the poll, thank you. So the story is a little bit about my journey with trust. And uh, this story goes back many, many years when I was in the IT industry. Some of you know I was in IT for 19 years. Uh, that ended 21 years ago. Yes, I'm that old. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the story is this. I had a career in IT. I ended up working for Microsoft. Um, yeah, that's me in 1995 with the Windows 95 launch and in 2000 with the Windows 2000 launch that, uh, that I actually headed up in South Africa. And in these days, I was um, kind of quite proud of myself in, in terms of my ability to build trust, my ability to connect with audiences, my ability to be trusted. But then I was promoted and I became a manager. Um, I became what they called the group product marketing manager. And uh, this resulted in me now leading people directly, direct reports. And what's really interesting is how that then began to evolve. And I started and I had a trust survey where they surveyed my team and I scored 100%. And I was so proud of myself. I then went through a really interesting period where I had a manager who was telling me exactly how I should lead my team. It wasn't true to myself. It wasn't authentic. And next year when we did the trust survey, I scored 50%. I was devastated. And I thought, but I'm a person of integrity. How on earth can I score so low in trust as a person of integrity? And it dawned on me, trust might be a little more complicated than I thought. And this was devastating. I found myself trying to crawl out of a hole. I found myself realizing that there were some things that if I wasn't being true to myself, I wasn't leading authentically. And if I wasn't leading authentically, I couldn't be trusted. So I went on a journey and that journey is a journey where I started to understand trust completely differently. Eventually I, 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 I came across some trust models. I realized that in relationship, trust is the most fragile piece and that needed some attention. And so a lot of us only know two things about trust. And, and, and I'm sorry if I'm insulting you by saying this, but maybe I should own this. At that time, I only knew two things about trust. Either you trust people or you don't trust people. It's that simple, right? It's like a switch. Either I trust you or I don't trust you. There's nothing else. There's nothing in between, right? The second thing that people think they know about trust is this, that basically you get two kinds of people those who will trust until trust is broken and those who will not trust until trustworthiness is proven. And this is a really interesting idea as well. And both of these ideas are not true. I'm going to blow both of them out the water, going to destroy both of these ideas. And I'll tell you immediately, I'm going to give you two examples. The one is on that first story of either I trust or I don't. I have a daughter who has a driver's license and can drive. And I have another daughter who doesn't have a driver's license and can't drive. Which one am I going to trust with my keys to my car to go to the shop? Does that mean I don't trust my younger daughter? No, I do. But I can't trust her to drive, right? By the way, they're both in their 30s. I told you I'm not young. Um, <laughs> and, and so, you know, this whole idea of trust or don't trust, it, it's, it's more complicated. The second piece I'm going to blow out the water is this thing of either you trust people until trust is broken. I generally am a very trusting person. I trust easily. But I assure you, when I arrive in certain airports in certain cities, and uh, by the way, I love Nigerians, but when you arrive in Lagos, and everybody, as you walk out the airport, wants to help you with your bags. They are not all to be trusted. <laughs> I want to find the guy with my hotel sign, with my name on his board, and it takes me to a hotel branded car 
that's the one I want to trust. And so you can see even this idea, even though generally I trust easily, I don't always trust it automatically. And so trust is more complicated. So let's, uh, let's unpack what is it. But before we do, we're going to be exploring today a new way to consciously build trust using this model, which we call AIR, A-I-R. So I'm going to be going into that in some detail. So why do we need trust? Let's jump into this quickly. Why do we need trust? Well, firstly, we're in a situation where trust is at an all time low in the corporate business space and in most business spaces. It's at an all time low because people are feeling disconnected. They are, we have the great resignation, we have mental health issues, we have uh, so many things that are emerging and that are showing that we are at a trust crisis. Uh, trust in corporate businesses is at an all time low, trust in governments, all time low. We, we, we desperately need more trust. And as Philippe has just said, it is the foundation of work in a team. Um, it is very, very difficult to work well in a team without trust. There's another reason though, and I'm just using two and there's many. Trust is an accelerator. So a lack of trust decreases efficiency, decreases effectiveness. It's very difficult. People in a low trust environment are doing things that aren't related to the task just because it's a low trust environment. So for example, they're getting signatures on everything because they don't want to be blamed later. So they're doing a lot of anti-blame work or what we call CYA, cover your assets. Let's use that word. Um, <laughs> that kind of thing. They, they, they're doing all sorts of things which are not directly task related simply because the environment is, is low trust. And there's so many stories of how trust accelerates. Things move quicker more effectively, more efficiently in high trust environments. So who needs it and when do we need it? Well, this is a very, very simple little thing. Well, it's like air and we need air all the time. So our teams need it, our clients need it, and it's like access to air. We want to make sure that everybody has it, that it is available. If you think about air for a moment, we can survive months without food. We can survive days without water, but we can only survive minutes without air. And air is that highest high energy state of the three main states of matter, solid, liquid, gas. Air is a gas and it's the, it's the higher energy area. And so we need air desperately in our teams and our relationships and our client relationships. So AIR is the model we're going to be exploring. So what does it stand for? Well, obviously it's an acronym, right? <laughs> it stands for Alliance, Integrity and Reliability. And this is where I'm going to be unpacking some of the complexity of the, uh, the of trust. We realize that it's so multifaceted and so situational. So let's get into this a little bit. So how can we nurture trust? How can we grow trust in our teams and our people, in our relationships and with our clients? So let's start with this alliance. Just pause for a moment. Think of the person in the world that you trust the most. And let me ask you a simple question and you don't have to put this in the chat or anything, but it's just for yourself. What is your relationship with that person? Guaranteed relationship and trust, levels of relationship, levels of trust um, work together. And so the level of alliance, the level of connection that we have directly impacts the level of trust and trust impacts the level of connection. And so the first aspect or the first perspective we're going to take care on trust is alliance. So what do we mean by that? Well, firstly, it means a relational approach. If our approach uh, to our clients is let me get as much money as I can. That's not going to be relational. Let's connect. Let's build relationships, relationships with our teams, relationships with our partners. The more a relational, our leadership approach, the more we are building trust. The next aspect is clarity. 
the clearer we can be in our communication, being a great listener, making sure that people that you you that that you are not only heard, but that they feel heard. When people feel heard, they automatically trust you. And so this clarity of communication, the clarity from ourselves to them, the clarity for them to us, the sense of being heard dramatically raises trust. It's all about the clarity of communication, the sense of being heard. The next one is vulnerability. This is very, very interesting. If we cannot be vulnerable, we cannot be trusted. It's such an interesting con concept. And I'm not talking about as a leader, you hang out all your dirty washing. We're talking about appropriate vulnerability. Let me give you a leadership example. If somebody is really struggling to learn something new, telling a story how you struggle to learn something new, that vulnerability makes them feel safe, makes them feel ah, oh, they can trust you. They can trust you that you're not going to beat them up for a learning problem. Okay. And that's really what we want to be able to do. We want to give a sense of vulnerability. Now, for me, more of an extrovert personality, I will probably share a bit more than an introvert will, but a level of vulnerability is critical to building trust. So, what is the state of trust in your team? I have a trust assessment that you can use. And if you are interested in said assessment, please put your email address into the chat. And if you put your email address into the chat, I will send you a link and it'll be your own assessment. You can, you can create a copy. It'll be on Microsoft Forms. And from that copy that you create, you can even edit it if you want to. You can even make it more um, specific to your team. So if you are interested, pop in your email address and we will make sure that you get access to the assessment. So uh, thank you very much. And Chris, if you can just make sure afterwards that I get these email addresses, that would be fantastic. Thank you. You got it. All right. So yes, this is exactly it. This is exactly it. So um, very simple assessment, um, free of charge to you, available to you, um, and you are welcome to use it with your teams uh, and in your partnerships as well. Very good. So let's move on to the second piece of this AIR model, which is integrity. Integrity is can we trust each other? Do we have a sense of integrity in our connection, in our relationship? Now, again, this is multifaceted. Most people, when they think of trust, they think of this. This is why when I was at Microsoft, I thought, well, my trust must be high because I'm integrous. Ah, okay, so let's have a look. What does it actually mean? So let's start with this accountability. Do we play the blame game? You want to destroy trust? Play the blame game. It's not my fault. It's that person. It's this person. It's the government. It's the it's the load shedding. It's it's the it's the traffic in Cape Town when it's raining. It's you know it's always somebody else's fault. Do that, and you're destroying trust. Take accountability, and you're building trust. And accountability really means ownership. That's really what it means. I was recently working with. Um, a group of executives in a bank and they were telling me that there was a, a trust problem that had emerged and you know what it came down to in the end is they were using this word accountable and the team members thought it meant who's to blame <laughs> so something would go wrong and they'd say well who's accountable and the team members thought it was who's to blame the senior leader actually said no 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 that's not what i mean i want to find out who's owning this so that i can support them to fix it and this was the big communication problem. So they actually agreed that whenever the word accountable came up from that point forward, it would mean ownership, not blame. And now you can imagine immediately when we left that day, the trust was at a new high and it was a, a brilliant session. So accountability. What else is integrity? Well, it's about ethics. You know, are we behaving ethically? Are we doing things which are illegal? Are we doing anything? Ken Blanchard has this wonderful saying, he says, oh, is this thing that we've decided to do or that we are doing, would we be okay if it was on the front page of the newspaper tomorrow? <laughs> and that's really the, the way to understand ethics, isn't it? It's that simple. It's really that simple. So, um, you know, I think that's, uh, that speaks for itself. And then what else is it? It's fairness. This is probably the most underestimated piece of this integrity issue 
within our um, teams and our leadership is that when we treat one person diff not differently, differently is okay, but unfairly versus another. Different is okay because people are at different development levels and we need to treat them uniquely. People have different personalities, we need to treat them uniquely. So treating people un uniquely is absolutely okay. But treating people unfairly? You know that wonderful saying that says people don't leave companies, they leave bosses? We've all heard that one. You know what the research actually says? They leave because of a break of trust. They believe because they perceived something to be unfair. So this is a massive part of ethics. And um, uh, I think it's, it's a really uh, significant thing. It's a really significant thing. Okay, so we've dealt with integrity. Now, let's look at reliability. Reliability. So this is the R from our air model. Now, this one, I've packed a lot of stuff into this. So... <laughs> Hold on to your hats, because the first piece of this is, can people depend on us? Can they depend on us? This is not about perfection, but it's about accessibility. Can they depend on us? If they need a response, can they get a response? If they need a, um, a, an answer, will they get an answer? Will they feel supported? If they um, are having trouble with something, will they feel like they're going to again be blamed or will we will we actually get back to them if we say we're going to do something will we do it it's all of those things of reliability and uh, dependability uh, and responsiveness all of this is part of this dependable aspect the second part of this r this reliability is experienced do our people have the knowledge and skills so this is back to my daughter who drives and has been driving for 15 plus years. Actually, I think it's 17 now. Uh, and the and my other daughter who doesn't, you know, do they have the experience? Do they have the competence? Do they have the abilities? Do they have the the knowledge, the skill um, to be able to do whatever this thing is that we need them to do from our position as leaders? Do our clients feel that we have experience, that we um, are knowledgeable? Are we, do we step into a level of authority when we are working with them? Do they sense that we actually have something to offer that is really gonna help them? So that's that one. And then finally, genius. Now this one might surprise you, and that's why I left it for last, is people rely on us or consider us reliable when they know where our genius is and we know where their genius is. So what do we, I mean by that? This is way beyond the experience and our typical, the way we think of a strength is something I'm good at. This is the ability to, to know that where to find my flow and where I know that my team members flow is. So I'll give you a simple example. I've been working on this and building this with my team for some time now. And one of the things that we've got, we've got somebody on my team called Cindy. And Cindy is an absolute genius about um, the way that she communicates with clients on a customer journey. She's an absolute genius at it. And I remember at one point I needed to cancel a meeting and I thought the clients were really not going to be happy about this. And I tried to think of about 20 different ways I could word it. And I suddenly thought, you know what, let me ask Cindy. And Cindy put out a message that everybody not only loved, but were actually really excited about what we were going to do instead of the meeting. And everybody was praising. And she put out this message in under five minutes from my request. In under five minutes, the message went out. And the, and the clients thought it was just absolutely brilliant. And they saw it as a win, not as a loss. I think if I'd worked on that for a week, I wouldn't have worded a message as well as she did in five minutes. And so she has a genius in that area. And, um, and that genius builds trust when people feel and sense your genius. So, um, you know, my genius certainly is not in accounting. So that's why we have a bookkeeper, you know, who is brilliant at it. Um, this is what we need to do. We need to know our geniuses and build the kinds of relationship. So, so Philippe is asking a great question. How do you know you're in your genius zone? So it's maybe to, maybe I can reword what we typically think of a strength. 
take away the idea that a strength is something you're good at. A strength is something that makes you feel strong, that makes you feel intelligent, that makes you feel like time is just flying by because I'm in the zone. A strength or a genius is where I feel sharp, I feel connected. So I'll give you an example for me, and this might be a little weird one, but I love speaking on stages. And when I'm speaking on a stage, I enter a different zone, a completely different zone. I'm physically in touch with myself. I'm physically, I'm, I'm connected with my audience. I spot things on people's faces and I know how to address them. I feel spiritually connected. I feel intellectually at my absolute sharpest. That's when I know I'm in my zone of genius. And we encourage us in our teams to be constantly exploring that and thinking about it. And so um, would it be the same as a talent? So Stephanie, I would agree with that, but I would add to it. A talent needs to be developed. We need to add knowledge and skill. So a talent is the raw material of genius. But often a genius will not fully emerge until we've got all the practice, all the knowledge, all the skill, and we've maybe dealt with some of the mindsets that have been holding us back. Then a talent is truly liberated into genius. But it does require a wiring. There, I'm never going to be a genius at accounting. Never. But uh, there are certain things which just come so naturally to me. And so this genius thing means I'm also aware of the opposite. I'm aware of where I feel stupid. I'm aware of where I feel like I, I have no talent for this. Uh, the activity drains me. Um, the activity bores me, all of these things. And I'm open about that too. So when we are open about our genius and our weaknesses, this builds trust. And it allows others, it liberates others. And I've seen this over and over again. As I step into my genius and I'm honest about my stupidity, <laughs> I'm going to use that word, it liberates others to do the same, and that dramatically increases trust. And of course, remember we said right up front that trust speeds things up? When we can rely on each other's genius, it speeds things up as well. So that's really what that is all about. So let us do a poll. So which of these elements stands out for you the most? And I'm going to kind of try and remember them all and go through them all. So the A is the alliance. Maybe it's the alliance that stood out for you the most. And within alliance, we were specifics. We talked about clarity. We talked about relationships, uh, a relational approach. We talked about um, vulnerability. Okay. So any of those four words, um, alliance, uh, relationship, clarity, and vulnerability, if that stood out for you, uh, or which one of those stood out for you, pop it into the chat. Then we spoke a little bit about eth um, about integrity. And there we mentioned um, ethics, we mentioned fairness, and we mentioned, um, what was the other one? Mm. Suddenly I can't remember what the other one is. Uh, <laughs> what was the first element there? Accountability. Accountability. Thank you very much. The non-blame one. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody's paying attention. Isn't that brilliant? Okay. And then this last element that we spoke of, which is the, um, the element of reliability, which is that responsiveness and, uh, um, and, and dependability. We spoke about the, uh, the experience piece. And then we spoke about the, uh, the other piece, which was the the genius. So which of all of these stood out for you? Um, and you can do, do multiple, you know, you're not limited to one answer, which of these stood out for you? Relationships and genius, let me just actually go and look at the other ones that have come through already integrity, big one. And thank you, Dave, for your comment earlier on about the newspaper thing. Appreciate that. Um, yeah. Uh, would you do the same thing if someone's watching? I love it. Uh, relationships, uh, my genius, integrity, genius and integrity. Very good. Very good, very good. Excellent. Accountability and, and, and not playing the blame game, uh, which will, yeah, these things are very interrelated, Philippe. Very, very inter interrelated. Val says the integrity and reliability, thank you. And Stephanie also integrity and experience, very nice. Excellent. 
Very, very good. Okay, lovely. Now, let us just try and bring things together a little bit. I'm going to give you a little invitation, a little challenge. So, what about your relationships and your team? Your relationships and your team, like pieces of a puzzle, we have these nine different aspects under three headings, alliance, integrity, and reliability. What would you like to do? And I'm not asking you to put this in the chat. I'm asking you to ask this question of yourself. What would you like to do to make sure that your team is at its most efficient, its most effective, what is your biggest takeaway? What is your number one action that you want to take? What do you want to do in terms of building trust with your children, with your team, with your clients, with your relationships? In other words, how are you going to help them to come up for air? Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to open it up for questions, but I want to ask a question. And this question, I'm going to be giving away a copy of my upcoming book, a limited edition copy, and we will send it to you wherever you are in the world. Okay. And it's a limited edition copy because this book is going to be the sort of coffee table version, full color print, lots of pictures, lots of uh, color diagrams and metallic finishes and all sorts of stuff. Um, this book I will be giving away uh, to one of you and I'm going to be asking a question for that. And it's the first person to answer correctly is going to get the copy of the book. And so, <laughs> All right. Here's the question. What does the A stand for in air? <laughs> Three is our winner. <laughs> Three, I need a better name than that. <laughs> I mean, not that there's anything wrong with being called three. It's a beautiful number. <laughs> mm. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so the A stands for alliance in the AIR model. Uh, yes, we did have accountability in there as one of the sub points, but uh, there we go. <laughs> Christina, of course, my goodness, but it's the, it is the hair color, sorry. That is what fooled me. Christina, beautiful. Yes, we were together in Bali in 2018. Can you believe that's nearly five years ago? Well, it is five. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Christina, that's beautiful. Um, so, Christina, I'm going to need your address. Um, uh, maybe I can give you my. Um, I wonder if that's. Okay. Um, I'm going to. Here is um, my email address. And if you can pop me your address details, um, we're still a month or so off getting the book out, so don't hold your breath. Um, but uh, Christina, I think that is brilliant. And um, I'm so glad that you've, you're the winner today. All right, so let's have some Q&A. Let's have some Q&A. Any comments, any uh, thoughts, any, um, uh, any interesting ideas? Philippe, let's hear some comments or questions from you. Yeah, so um, I got a, a bit of a case study here. Um, as you know, you know, I'm from Europe and I've been living in Austria for quite some years. And uh, there's a specific behavior here in Austria that I find a bit difficult. And I'm not sure if it's cultural because of the people I work with, but um, they don't like conflict or health conversation or, you know, and they will do everything they can to avoid them. And for me, it's really essential to have them because I'm building partnership with some of my clients and I need to have those difficult conversations and they are not aggressive or anything. It's just, okay, well, we need to address that. And I find it as a way that um, a lot of the time they 
would not respond. They would um, ignore the request or just dodge the whole thing. And I can come back several times and it would keep dodging. So um, I'm not sure exactly which is which, but I'd like to know what would be a good um, change of tactics or behaviors or mindset so that I can really have those conversations without the partners and clients to be to feel threatened. This is such a good question, and it's so foundational to trust. Uh, you know, in my model, it's probably under the relationship piece and the vulnerability piece to some extent. Um, and uh, let me quickly, and it's also actually interesting enough under integrity. And so let me tell a bit of a story, and then I'm going to see how I can answer your question. So the story I want to tell you is um, when I was at Microsoft, I also had a big trust success. In fact, a significant trust success. Now, those of you who are old enough may remember that back in the late 1990s, there was an antitrust case against Microsoft in the US. And um, it was a big thing that went on for years and years and years. And many people later said it's because Microsoft had never donated to any of the political parties, um, which is a whole nother story. And that's how the American politics system works, which, yeah, let's not go there. So, um, but the reality is that Microsoft was not considered a trustworthy organization at all. And what was happening is whenever somebody was asking difficult questions, um, you know, the, the, the sort of correct answer was being given, um, not the vulnerable answer. And we had one particular journalist here in South Africa, one of the technical journalists, and I recently met him again at a, at a very interesting event. Um, and uh, so more than 20 years later, but I remember we were about to do a big product launch and um, there was a story that had come out that the product that we were about to launch still had over 65,000 bugs in the product. Okay. And I knew he was going to ask me about this and the PR agency almost didn't want to do the interview because they knew we were going to get all sorts of questions from this guy. Uh, it was going to be kind of a, a whole you know, trust test in a way. And I remember him um, uh, and I said, I, I want to do this. I want to, I want to give it a try. I want to see what can happen. And um, uh, he, he did ask me about that. And I said, well, firstly, let's define what a bug is. So I then told him exactly how we defined a bug. So a bug could be if somebody didn't like the wording in a pop-up box, that was a bug. It was reported. We may in the end disagree with their grammar and and not change it but it was reported and therefore it was an outstanding issue so these were not necessarily crashes or anything like that in fact by the time we launched this particular product we'd been running it for a year inside microsoft reliably so we 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 knew the overall integrity of the product was quite good but what i said to him was you're right we we have a problem here and we do have an imperfect product but we have a really good product and this is why it's good. And I listed sort of nine reasons why it's good. And I listed one reason why he was right to ask the question. And for the first time in his work with Microsoft, he wrote a positive article. He'd always written negative articles. And for the first time ever, he wrote a positive article. And so for me, one of the things that I want to introduce with this vulnerability idea is that when we only give good news, people don't trust us. When we can mix up the good news with the bad news, and by the way, the ideal ratio for human beings is one to five. Mm -hmm. So for every one piece of criticism, we need at least five compliments. And, and the, the research actually says it's between four and 20 for adults and a little bit different for children. But we really want to be showing that integrity and vulnerability by not only giving good news. So now back to your question, Philippe, that was just a bit of context overall, which I think I, I maybe missed earlier on when I was speaking. So for me, it's creating the kind of environment, the kind of scenario where um, we, can, we can have a relationship where it's okay to talk about the good and the bad, where we have the kind of the vulnerability, the connection, the level of connection and 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 if you can't we then need to take the conversation up to a meta level so mm -hmm. if for example we're having conversations around con conflict and we're not getting through 
we then need to have a conversation about why our conflict conversations aren't working. Uh, and sometimes that's what changes it. So I've seen this, I, I don't know so much with the client relationship like you're talking about, but I've seen this with team members. When somebody just can't handle criticism, okay, to eventually start talking about the fact that they can't handle criticism. So you take it up a level. So you're not talking about, you, you talk about this and they reject you. You talk about this and they reject it. And eventually you see this pattern and you now talk about the pattern. Mm -hmm. And for me, that approach is how we often get around things, is that approach of taking it up a level uh, to talk about the, the, the problem as opposed to the specifics where we've not been getting the responses that we're looking for. Um, and it, it, it creates this environment because we want the kind of conversations where we can deal with all the good stuff and highlight the occasional bad thing as well. I see Marie has actually put in here, I have a, a, a monthly um, Morpheus Intelligence update and um, the, we, we've got a recording of that session. It's 30 minutes. Uh, all, all of those intelligence updates are 30 minutes. And so um, uh, Marie's just saying, because Marie's on my leadership team and um, saying how it transformed our um, approach to conflict because of that. So we, uh, this was something I dealt with just a couple of months ago in that intelligence update, and that can give you some extra there. So if you want to watch that video, um, it's really about what we call functional conflict. Maybe I can quickly explain the concept. In any relationship, zero conflict is dysfunctional. Zero conflict is dysfunctional. Too much conflict, rage, war, <laughs> abuse is dysfunctional. But there's a sweet zone in the middle, which is called functional conflict. It's the, it's the space where the result of the conflict improves the relationship and the deliverables and the outputs. Too little conflict means that we are not going to get everybody's ideas. We're not going to get the full solutions. Too much conflict means that we're getting personal. We're attacking people um, uh, and all that kind of thing. But somewhere in the middle is a sweet spot and it's called functional conflict. And, um, and it's a trust builder being able to manage conflict. So let's say, for example, person A says it's got to be this and person B says, no, it's got to be this. We go a level deeper and say, What's driving your need for A to be the answer? Go to person B, what's driving your need for B to be the answer? And from that, we now understand the root issue and we can find a solution that addresses both. That's functional conflict. And that's what we're really aiming for. So um, uh, that, that's a great thing. So we call it functional conflict or um, positive conflict. Um, so thank you for all the comments coming through in the chat. What a great question from Philippe. So, um, conflict in aviation, Dave, got to hear about that. Tell us about conflict, the need for conflict in aviation. Yeah, thanks, Ian. I spent 25 years on a rescue helicopter and, oh, yes, um, of course. Mm. and then one of the things that I teach these days, those who can do and those who can't teach, um, is I, t I talk about crew resource management, which is, uh, essential skills, soft skills, all of that stuff. But when there's no conflict, then you get the pilot being God and people not, not challenging them on things that are unsafe. So there has to be conflict in order to have safe flight. And um, But I really like that. The um, functional conflict is a great way to describe it. So thank you. Yeah, I'm stealing yeah. that one, just so you know. You, you're welcome. You're welcome. I don't have a copyright on it. Um, so, uh, Dave, I, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Um, we uh, was we, um, Marie and I were recently listening to, um, for me, one of the best books I've ever read, I think, which is More Time to Think by uh, Nancy Klein. And she relates two such stories, the, the one being a surgeon who refused to listen to the nurse that he was about to operate and take out the wrong kidney. And, um, uh, and, and, and again, it's that same thing. There, 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 there was no room for functional conflict. And of course, we all know the ones of the various airline crashes that were simply caused by the pilot um, overriding the, um, the other team members or the team members not even feeling that they can raise an issue, uh, which they're very aware of. Um, and yeah, the pilot becoming God is a, is a thing. So yeah, uh, absolutely brilliant stories. And we wanna get away from that. We wanna get to functional conflict where um, actually the, uh, 
the conf the result of the conflict is is better for the team and for the individuals um, uh, concerned. Better for the client, better for delivery, all that kind of stuff. Excellent. More questions. Hey, Dave, one Go more question. I, I love your presentation with the power, well, whatever it was with you on the side. What are you using for the software there? <laughs> yeah, that one. Like, how do you do that? That's fantastic. <laughs> well, actually, you can do something similar to this in PowerPoint itself these days on Zoom. So Zoom has an ability when you're sharing screen, you've got uh, additional options and you can go in there and you can superimpose yourself onto your slides. What I've done here is a little bit more complicated. I've got um, PowerPoint running in a window and um, I'm using some software called Ecamm Live. So I'm on a Mac and a, okay. I'm using software called Ecamm Live and it creates what yeah. they call a virtual camera and it's various layers. So if I switch, for example, to my boardroom, if I show you my hand here, um, so I've got a backdrop layer, then it's me, and then it's my logo. So it's actually three different layers that I'm using here. Yeah, so, yeah. and then of course I've set up a little, um, and if you can see that at all, but a little switch box as well, a stream deck um, to actually switch between them and switch my slides and all that kind of stuff. So this is my job. So oh, you've got a bigger stream oh, deck than me. Uh, I haven't set it up yet and I use OBS, but thank you. Now, uh, now I know it's so, possible. Yeah, Marie's absolutely. getting all excited there. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> loving cool. the tech. So yes, Dave, exactly that. Um, the the OBS is um, uh, is uh, a same. cheaper version of what I use with Ecamm Live. Yeah. Cool. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Okay, another question from somebody uh, uh, about trust or anything else about leadership. No more questions. Very good. Okay. Well, Ben, Chris, it's back to you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. I really enjoyed myself this morning. Well, this afternoon for you, or well, evening for you. <laughs> um, I see here, Ian, we've got one from Christine. Um, when building a new team, what should I look for in trust? Wow, I missed that. Thank you very much. There we go. Thank you from Christine. Thank you very much. So um, when building a new team, so actually when you're building a new team, uh, I'm so glad you asked this question um, because there's wonderful research on this. Whenever we're starting a new team and we are creating what I call the team charter, the kind of founding documents for the team, which really for me is in three areas. It's the why, why do we need this team? Why do we even exist as a team? And then secondly, the who, who have we got here? What are the talents? What's the genius? All that kind of stuff. And then the how, how do we want to be together to achieve our why? So the who do we have to achieve our why? The how are we going to be together to achieve our why? Which is meetings, communications. What are we doing on email? What are we doing face to face? You know, all that kind of stuff. The research says when you do that up front with a team, it is a trust accelerator bigger than anything. So by simply getting the team together and going through why are we, uh, who are we, and how do we want to be to achieve that why um, already accelerates trust. Uh, and so um, maybe I can just elaborate slightly on each of those. The, the, the um, why of the team is the purpose. Um, it's the connection. We want to build connection. We want to get people to understand each other a little bit. Um, it's also... Uh, to introduce the concept of trust, you know, and you're welcome to to use the air model if that helps you. The 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 who of the team is things like um, preferences. Do we know each other's preferences? Uh, do we know each other's genius? Um, I use a tool typically something like a standout. I don't know if you know Marcus Buckingham's standout. So if you go to marcusbuckingham.com, uh, uh, you can get the standout assessment there. And the first page of the result of that assessment, it's about an 11 page um, uh, report it gives you, but the first one, uh, once it brings your result up, is my greatest value to the team. And so we share that between us. We talk about each person's greatest value to the team. So that's part of that who. And um, it, it is genius. Thank you, Val. It's one of my favorites, and I'm using it, in fact, uh, with teams regularly. 
Um, so um, thank you for the comment there, Val. And so the, the, the standout assessment, and it's free, which is fantastic, um, gives everybody that sort of insight as to what each person is bringing and offering to the team. My favorite question in the who part of a team is, what strengths are you offering to the purpose of this team? What strengths are you offering to the purpose of this team? And I think that can really be uh, very, very useful. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and I think you might find that really interesting as well. Then the third part is this, how do we want to be together? Um, when are we going to meet? What platforms? By the way, email is not collaboration. <laughs> I want to be clear. <laughs> People think email is a collaboration tool. It's not a collaboration tool. It's an information dissemination tool. Um, so what are your collaboration tools? Do you want to use a platform like Microsoft Teams or, or Trello or something else to be able to collaborate? Or is it always face to face in a meeting? What constitutes a meeting? Why do you need a meeting? Uh, we recently heard that um, uh, Spotify have banned meetings of more than two people. You, if you, <laughs> which is really interesting because they're saying, you know, the more people in a meeting, the more time is wasted, right? So if you've got a 10 minute time waste and you've got six people there, you've just wasted an hour, you know? So it's really interesting. Now I'm not, by the way, against meetings with more people, but when do you need a meeting and when do you not? We, in our last Morpheus Intelligence update, uh, just a few weeks ago, I think two weeks ago, we actually asked this question, which of these various actions do you want to take? And you know what came out number one? Eliminate unnecessary meetings. Eliminate unnecessary came out as the number one uh, poll answer when we did that session two weeks ago. And so we, we want to decide what do we need a meeting for? And I would say we need meetings for connection and trust. We often do, don't need meetings for things like an update on a project, we can put that onto somewhere else. We often, you know, there's so many things we can do without a meeting and we need to be very clear about what we do need a meeting for. And all of that's part of the how of teaming. So, so Christina, to go back to your question, when you do that work thoroughly, why are we a team? Who are we and who, what is each person bringing? And how are we gonna be together as a team? The result is, immediately you've accelerated trust in your team. You've actually leapt forward in the amount of trust that already now exists in the team. And this is well researched, by the way. A clear team charter dramatically increases trust um, because there's now clarity. So I think, uh, I think that might be quite useful. Uh, great comments coming through. I see that uh, Maria's given you a link about team purpose. Um, it was really good there. Um, great question. Okay. Um, yeah, meetings can be a waste of time. So I think we want to, re to, to, to have better ways of how we're going to collaborate, how we're going to be together. Okay. So let's see, we've got uh, a comment or question here from Aisha. Let me have a quick look. Uh, okay, we are about to run out of time. Thank you, Chris. So let me have a quick look at Aisha's uh, comment here. Recently read um, ROC return on character, similar insights, integrity, responsibility are key uh, pillars, but also compassion and forgiveness. Your thoughts on this and more heart leadership. So for me, conscious leadership is heart leadership. It's authentic leadership. And if it's authentic, it needs vulnerability. And if it's vulnerable, we need compassion and forgiveness. So this is not about perfection. And I think if anybody walks away from this thinking we have to be perfect in all nine areas, in all three categories and, and all nine subcategories that I've just mentioned today, then we are in trouble. We need to have compassion for ourselves. That's where the vulnerability comes in. And we need to have compassion for others. And so I love your comment. And I personally believe it's one of the aspects, in fact, I recently was doing this presentation to a large group at Microsoft in the US. And uh, one of the things that came back was, I love the model, but please do we not use perfectionism in it. And I said, absolutely, let's, let's, let's remove perfectionism. If you as a leader are trying to be perfect, you're trying to be a machine and people want to follow people, not machines. So you really want to have that vulnerability and the ability to show compassion and forgiveness to yourself and to know how to apologize and to show compassion and forgiveness to others. And, uh, and to, um, uh, yeah, I think that is absolutely critical. So thank you very much. And um, 
ah, digital body language session from Marie as well. Uh, there's a, that, that is another one that's much, yeah, thank you very much. And for the whole library of all our Morpheus intelligence updates that we've been doing for about two and a half years now, um, they are available there as well. Thank you, everybody. Chris, back to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ian, for joining us this week. And um, we've got another surprise next week. We've got um, Ian's partner, uh, Marie, will be, will be our guest. And um, she will be talking about media strategies for visionaries. This is going to be quite an interesting one. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. And yet again, Ian, thank you for sharing all that knowledge. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. Cheers, everyone.